Hi, everyone. My name is Kimberly Olson, and I'm the Executive Director of the New York City Arts and Education Roundtable. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome you to the Roundtable season kickoff, Bridging the Divide, Making Connections Between Personal Impact and Communal Change. For those of you that might be new to the Roundtable, the Roundtable is a grassroots service organization working to improve and advance the state of arts education through professional developments, advocacy, resource sharing, as well as creating platforms like this to connect our arts education field. We are extremely proud to be the convening body for New York City's arts education community and act, are proud to act in service to our robust and vibrant field, especially at this time. I'd like to begin today by acknowledging the indigenous peoples of all lands that we are on today. While we are meeting now on a virtual platform, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the land which we each call home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and to improve our own understanding of local indigenous peoples and their cultures. Throughout New York City, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of the Lenape, Canarsie, and Rockaway tribes. This recognition and respect of indigenous peoples and their lands is key towards reconciliation. Thank you. Um, a few housekeeping notes before we move on to the next part of our season kickoff. Um, we encourage all of our wonderful attendees on the call today to please use the chat box to ask questions, share resources, comment, and connect with other participants. A copy of this chat box will be saved and shared with you following this meeting. This call does include closed does include, excuse me, closed captioning. To activate the setting, please click the little arrow next to the closed captioning button on your screen and select show subtitles. In that same menu is the subtitle settings where you can adjust the size of the captions. I'm also proud to share that it is arts education week and we're happy to have this be one of those arts education arts and education week celebrations happening now across the country we encourage everyone on this call to join us in celebrating this amazing week hosted by americans for the arts by commenting on social media with the hashtag because of arts ed um, in addition to the chat box we will be sharing um, the session will be recorded and will be shared on our website the recording and any materials as well as the chat box will be emailed to you after the call likely by um, monday this call will be using breakout groups as well those rooms will not be recorded so please feel free to talk openly and candidly in those spaces um, i also wish to shout out our uh, roundtable staff members who are on the call i'm joined by kinsey keck who is our roundtable membership and programming manager, and I believe our newest roundtable staff member, Melando Jones, who is our communications and resources manager, is also on the call as well. Um, if you need anything, please feel throughout the call, please feel free to private message any one of us and we'll do our best to assist. I'm now going to transition us um, into a memorial for our dear friend and colleague, Paul King. Paul is a longtime advocate for arts education and an ally to the cultural community, especially in his role as executive director of the Office of Arts and Special Projects at the New York City Department of Education. Um, we have a lovely tribute video that we've put together in his honor. It will share that due to the Zoom platform, you may experience a little bit of lagging on the video and we apologize for any inconvenience. We will be sharing a copy of this lovely tribute to our dear friend with you in an email following this webinar. So with that, I'm gonna ask Kinsey to please uh, share with us that video. Welcome to the New York City Arts and Education Roundtable's tribute to our friend, Paul King. I'm Kati Kerner. I'm the Director of Education at Lincoln Center Theater and a member of the Board of Directors of the New York City Arts and Education Roundtable. Today, you will hear from a few of Paul's many friends among the Roundtable's community of arts education practitioners. You will hear about the many ways that Paul tirelessly advocated for and supported partnerships between schools and cultural organizations. I first met Paul during his days at the New York City Opera and happily served on committees with him at Lincoln Center. Once he joined the New York City Department of Education, I had the pleasure of working with him on a wide array of projects over the years through my work at Lincoln Center and through the round table. Paul always brought his sensibility as an artist and as a parent of two daughters in New York City's public schools to his work with the Department of Education. 
He was both a bureaucracy whisperer and also on occasion a bureaucracy translator, both invaluable for those of us in the cultural community. Paul had a great laugh that ranged from a conspiratorial cackle to a full-on laugh that started in his shoulders and spread from there. He loved his family fiercely and shared their accomplishments proudly. I can count the number of times I saw Paul in his shirt sleeves on one hand. At all other times, he wore suits in the most fantastic colors and textures, usually paired with creative socks. Paul had style. Paul was my friend and my colleague, and I will remember him always. Hi, I'm Jen Debella. And I'm Shoba Kavanakudio, and we're the co-chairs of the New York City Arts and Education Roundtable. And on behalf of the entire Roundtable community, we want to acknowledge Paul's lifelong commitment to providing the young people of New York City with a robust arts education. He was fiercely committed to access and equity, his vision for quality arts education for students throughout the New York City public schools included strong partnerships with the cultural community, and he was an important advocate for those partnerships. Throughout his tenure at the DOE's Office of Arts and Special Projects, he was a great friend to the roundtable. Paul's legacy will live on with each young artist, and he will greatly be missed. Almost every Sunday for nine years, I would meet Paul in Central Park, across from his building, with his two dogs, Duke and Daisy, and my two dogs, Massimo and Francesco. Paul always brought two mugs of coffee, and some weeks he brought his homemade blueberry buckle, which is to this day the best coffee cake I've ever had. We would sit and watch our dogs play, and we did what all dog owners do. We talked about our dogs. It was a much needed break from our busy work weeks. And I looked forward to what I came to call Sundays in the Park with Paul. I met Paul in 2003 when Sharon Dunn asked me to be on a committee that interviewed the finalists for the citywide director of theater position. We interviewed 12 of probably the most impressive and respected people in arts education. And afterwards, it was clear to all of us that Paul was the person for the job. It was unanimous. Soon after that, Paul asked me to be a contributing writer on The Blueprint. We worked together for almost nine months on the acting, directing, and playwriting sections. I would write a few pages and send them to Paul, and he would send them back to me with his suggestions and edits. And as with everything I came to learn about Paul, his ideas were right on the money, always. Working with him on that project and over the years was probably the best collaboration of my life, and I'm grateful to him for that. There are many moments with Paul that stand out, but there's one that stays with me more than most. It was 2006, and it was on the final day of a week-long PD for teachers on directing that Paul asked me to teach. The teachers had just finished staging scenes and songs with students, and when the sharing was over, I turned and looked at Paul, and he had tears running down his face. The teachers and I were shocked and, and a little surprised. We thought, did we fail? Was this so awful? And Paul looked at the teachers, and with tears in his eyes, he said, it warms my heart to see all of you who gave up your winter break to spend six hours a day here in the pursuit of excellence and personal growth. And it makes me very hopeful for the future, knowing that you are teaching our kids. Well, we were all in tears. The teachers looked at Paul with so much admiration. They had never had that kind of affirmation from an administrator before. And it changed their lives. And that was Paul in a nutshell. He was a dedicated champion for teachers and students. Everything he did, every breath he took, was in service to his belief that kids need art in their lives and in their schools, and that teachers need champions in their corners to support them. What I learned from Paul 
was immeasurable. I'm a better teacher and I'm a better person because of him. I will miss his wisdom, his leadership, his compassion, his humor. But most of all, I will miss our Sundays in the park with our dogs and his blueberry buckle. Thank you, Paul. Hello, my name is Madeline Cohen. I'm the education director at Symphony Space. Um, back in 2001, I got a call from a Paul King, who was the education director at the New York City Opera, inquiring about a possible collaboration between Symphony Space and City Opera. So we set up a meeting and I'd say within 10 or 15 minutes, we realized that actually that collaboration was not going to work. But we ended up talking for another hour or more about everything, opera, the arts, education, our lives, and we really became friends. Um, we, I worked on the blueprint with him once he became the director of the Office of Arts and Special Projects. And even when that work tapered off, and I really only saw him once a year at the annual uh, Arts and Cultural Education Services Fair at the Brooklyn Museum, I always got such a warm reception from him. And there always was that warm feeling that I will treasure and remember always. Paul was a tireless champion for the media arts education community. He spearheaded the creation of the Moving Image Blueprint and offered extensive professional development opportunities for media arts educators. One of his dreams was to create a New York City public school student film festival. In 2019, that dream became a reality. He celebrated the young artist's use of film to tell stories, make us laugh, and move us to action. The 2020 online festival was dedicated to Paul's memory and his legacy. I'm David Shokoff, Director of Education at Manhattan Theatre Club and the founding chair of the New York City Arts and Education Roundtable. And I was fortunate enough to have known Paul King for some 30 years. Throughout his career, Paul was an ardent and courageous champion for the arts, a diligent and dedicated leader, a tireless and formidable advocate, and an imaginative, innovative, and effective educator. I still recall the intellect and the insight he displayed years ago in his presentation on the extraordinary programs he had created as the education director at New York City Opera, integrating opera production with social studies themes. I think that was my first encounter with Paul, and I remember thinking at the time, boy, this guy is good. As the executive director of the DOE Arts Office, Paul created a legacy of programs and policies that will long outlive his sad and untimely departure, ensuring that the arts remain central to the, to the lives of the city's children for years into the future. Uh, it was a privilege and an honor to have collaborated with Paul and to have learned from him over the years. We will all miss his leadership and his vision. But most of all, I will miss Paul's friendship. We were neighbors and we would often ride the C train together at 8 a.m., sharing our frustrations and our aspirations on the way to work. And we would get together regularly in Central Park on Sunday mornings. I would finish up my morning run on the Great Hill where Paul and Steve Domeno would be walking their dogs. Uh, Paul would sometimes offer me a tissue to kind of spruce up and after a while I got the hint and brought my own. Uh, Paul and Steve would palaver about their pooches a uh, topic on which I had very little to offer, though I did get fairly adept at throwing sticks and balls. But I relished and cherished our conversations about arts education and public policy and the latest theater gossip and the newest restaurants and the doings of our families. It is those Sundays in the park with Paul that I will miss most of all. Paul King. 
His passing is such a loss to the arts community. With Paul as executive director of the Office in Arts and Special Projects, the pendulum swung toward expanding arts in the schools, especially where it was needed most. He was a passionate advocate and also someone who really knew how to work within the system and create efficient delivery systems. He was able to staff up both in the classroom and in the support staff at the Department of Ed. I first knew Paul when he was director of education of the New York City Opera around the time I became head of education at New York Philharmonic around 2004. He was a wonderful colleague across the campus, but little did I suspect then what kind of a leader he was destined to become. He became first the head of theater at the city schools and then the executive director of the Office of Arts and Special Projects. And was he ever the right man for that time? I became co-chair of the New York City Arts and Education Roundtable around that time. And my co-chair, Kati Kerner, and I would have coffee with Paul several times a year to keep up to date on changes at the DOE and to keep the whole cultural community, which we represent through the roundtable, tied in with that. And boy, did change come fast with Paul and under Chancellor Carmen Farina and the de Blasio administration. As he engineered this radical expansion of arts teachers in the classroom, and of the support staff at the Department of Education necessary for them to do their job well, he would come to see us for coffee and he was just ever unflappable, never a word about the significant health challenges he was going through personally. He might look tired, but he, his mind was always full of ideas and energy and moving forward, finding the right people for the right jobs around him. He seized the moment and we're all better off for it. I, I miss Paul so much and I miss knowing that there was such a pro and such a caring man at the center of what we do for the arts and for the students of New York City. My name is Shoba Kavanakudio. I'm the director of the graduate program in educational theater at the City College of New York. I'm also one of the co-chairs of the Arts and Education Roundtable, along with Jennifer DiBella. I am thrilled to introduce to you our moderator for the next uh, half hour or so, um, Darrell Cooper. Darrell Cooper is the founder and CEO of Cultural Innovation Group. He is also the creator and the host of the web series Flow, as well as an adjunct instructor at the City College of New York. He's a former program officer at the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and prior to joining DCLA, he worked at Lincoln Center Education on multiple social impact projects. Darrell graduated from the Impact Program for Arts Leaders at Stanford University and currently is pursuing his doctorate at NYU. Darrell, welcome. I'm going to pass it along to you. Shoba, thank you so much for that incredible uh, introduction. Uh, it's so good to be here holding this virtual space with everyone. Um, before I, I introduce Lisa, I thought it would be good for all of us to uh, come into this virtual space together. Um, and I want to do that by us all taking a collective breath together. Uh, so if you feel comfortable, uh, if you would just close your eyes and then breathe in on a three count, two, three, out, two, three. Let's try that one more time. In, two, three, and out, two, three. You can open your eyes. So I have the honor today to talk to uh, Lisa Yancey. What does one say about Lisa? Uh, recently coined a strategic maven by a longtime colleague, Lisa Yancey is an organizational development consultant who specializes in strategic organizational planning, business planning, program evaluation and assessments, executive project management, revenue modeling, leadership coaching, and organizational structure assessments for nonprofit or institutions. She is the president of Yancey Consulting LLC, 
an organizational and leadership development consulting firm committed to unlocking, provoking, facilitating, and collaboratively imagining equitable social impacts on the local and national level. Uh, she's worked across the arts and culture sector, youth development, social justice, media justice, economic justice, and open internet uh, sectors. She's collaborated with over a hundred companies with almost 20 years of experience, uh, which is just phenomenal. Uh, she is a graduate of Emory University, uh, as well as Boston College Law School, where she holds a Juris Doctorate. Uh, she's a former professional dancer and choreographer, and has been a member of the New York State Bar Association since 2000. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming uh, the phenomenal Lisa Yancey. Thank you. Thank you, Darrell. Wow. I am old. <laughs> I'm getting older. That's, I was like 20 years here. Wow. Really amazing. Thank you for that. Well, you are aging like wine and getting uh, better with time. Yeah. You know, I would, I would like to say that if uh, on the seventh day, if God rested, uh, on the eighth day, she created Lisa Gancy. Uh, and you will all soon find out that that is true. Uh, let's, let's start there. So for those who may not be familiar uh, with you or your work, tell us a little bit about your, your background. How did we get here today? Sure. Um, before I go in about me, I just want to just acknowledge Paul Keene. I didn't know Paul. I didn't know him at all. But my mother would say to us, at the end of the day, what's your dash? And what she meant by that, she'd ask us, you have your birthday, and you have your end day. And everything that matters in between is your dash. And the quality of who you are, how you are, the lives you touch, the imprints you leave behind is the quality of your dash. And I have to say that Paul Kane's dash feels like it continues to extend an infinity. And I'm grateful to have had a moment to hear the words for, from the few of those whose lives he touched and who continues to touch. So I wanna acknowledge him. And I think that starting with Paul and recognizing the dash is a great segue for us to think about what our own dash will be in this moment, what our own dash will be of who will call upon who we are, what we did, whose lives we touched during the time that we had. So thank you, thank you for that. And I was thinking about this question when you're like, well, how do you get here? And I actually wanna start by, when I was thinking about how I got here, I always, we get wherever we are through people. It always starts with the people who touch our lives. So I'm gonna name some names of the various people who touch and have touched my life from elementary school and Ms. McCall and Ms. Wheeler was French, Ms. McCall was dance, Ms. Stovall, the social worker who came to my house after I dropped out of high school because I had a traumatic experience, left it as an AP student, <laughs> free going to college, dropped out, who came to my house, Ms. Dooley, to the love I had from my father who from the beginning from up until one, and then I didn't see him again for 16 years. That first imprint of love, and then that last, and then for us to come back in this space right now and rekindle love gave me the, the understanding of what's possible in humanity and life. I wanna thank those who, um, the, my love for reading, <laughs> my thirst for learning, uh, the dance and the dance and the dance and the dance. I tell people all the time that dance is what got me through law school. Anyone wants to know how to do anything to understand the core of discipline and who you are and to learn um, various translations of expression and vocabulary, dance. I'm grateful for dance. Mickey Shepard, Maureen Knighton, Joan Sandler, Helen Cash Jackson, Nora Davis Day, Dean Vera Rory, Dr. Trudier Harris, all are part of how I am, these phenomenal women my squad, my people, Lynette Cade, Makita Daugherty, Sunday, Abernathy, Mahogany Taylor, Carmen Grau, Candace Jackson, Jenny, 
um, Gia Hamilton, Celeste, Maisha, Teresa, June, Pi, all are you got to have your people to do this work, people who keep you honest, people who will tell you who you are and how you are, and people who you won't even have to call when you're in trouble because they're right there with you. You got to have some people like that. I want to thank my friends Craig and Sway and your and my partners and my loves, all of them. Um, my kitchen cabinet who give me resolve. Um, James Baldwin, Audrey Lord, um, Polly Murray, Ida B. Wells, Oprah Winfrey, Nair Wahid, Elon Musk is part of my kitchen cabinet, and Tom Sowell. I'd like to thank my grandmother, who was my first mother, who named me Lisa, because Lisa actually isn't my official name, who said I want to call her that, and that's the power of that. And I want to thank my siblings. I have, I'm the eldest of seven. Um, and, and, and if these are the people who all bring me here, how I got here. And so, yes, I went to Emory and I went to law school and I've been in New York now for 21 years come September 1, originally from Atlanta, Georgia, uh, read voraciously. But I realized it's the people and it's the relationships that you build, that you hold, um, is one of the greatest assets one could ever have. That's how I got here. Yes, yes, yes. See, so you've already dropped enough gems for like earrings and a necklace and like a bracelet and a watch. Like you can keep going on. Um, so one of the one of the uh, names that you mentioned was uh, Maureen Knighton. Uh, for homework, everyone was supposed to read the Thrivability Report that was uh, commissioned through uh, Doris Duke. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the concept of thrivability, because you've really, you know, coined that term, at least uh, in my eyes, you've coined it, and you've pushed it uh, to a level of, of scholarship worth uh, deeper and further exploration. I would really like to talk about this idea of thrivability and how that differs from just uh, surviving, particularly as it may relate to um, uh, uh, people from BIPOC communities uh, or organizations that are uh, led by and or serving uh, the BIPOC community. So I certainly want to lift up Maureen Knighton, um, but I also want to lift up Carrie McCarthy with the New York Community Trust. So it was both Doris Duke Charitable Foundation and New York Community Trust who actually commissioned that work and have been and continue to be um, deep thought partners. Um, so any output, I wanna hold and I wanna say that everything that, that I may do is a part of a we. So I am one of we and we are all contributing to these various outputs. And when Carrie and Maureen entrusted um, this, this commission with me and my team, um, lifting up Yolitha Croslin, who's been with me. Um, we were talking about sustainability and we were looking at organizations within New York City specific and we had conversations about even having a threshold of $200,000 because we already knew what more we were still making invisible by not acknowledging those who are doing tremendous work in communities with operating budgets under $200,000. And the concept of um, sustainability was like, how do we sustain? What do we need to do differently? How do we rethink this as part of the sourcing, the nutrient ecosystem for um, these organizations? And as Yolitha and I, and in conversation with a number of the partners on the ground, um, I'm grateful for the relationships that I've been able to develop and hold over the years with many, many, many community leaders throughout the country and especially in New York, New York City. Um, so through those conversations, we're like, well, if we're going to be doing the work on the what to do differently and how to do differently, do we want to do work that just gets us to a baseline of like sustaining? Like, is that the moonshot? Like, is the goal to like, let's sustain? And I understand that, that, that operating in spaces that of deficit um, and not deficit by your actions, but deficit by the structures and systems that continue to sustain in places because the, the system doesn't work unless you are oppressed in that way, which is why we need new systems. Um, 
so how do we rethink if we're going to do some some dreaming and some strategies past the drain where do we need to go we need to flourish and so this idea of thrivability and if we break down um, thinking about the ability to thrive, the ability to flourish, and not just hold it within an economic frame, because economic is only one lens. It is not um, the only metrics. Um, I believe that one of the greatest assets are relationships. I think it has one of the most conversion and um, compounding yields, to use economic terms. I think that if we think about the impacts we're having in our communities, the lives that we're touching, what we're leaving behind, we should be flourishing. And so what are the ways to think about um, building strategies that has the ability to flourish? And that became the foundation. And it also connected to uh, many years ago when we started Yancey Consulting. I started Yancey Consulting in 2001. And um, one of the things that over the years, and it started out in, in arts and culture, and it moved to social justice and media justice, public space, environment. And one of the things that, um, I held as a tagline was moving beyond sustainability, right? Like even then it was like, how do we move beyond just sustaining? Cause sustaining just felt like I'm doing a one-to-one -one return on my efforts. I have nothing left over. So every single time I got to do that same amount to get the same return over and over and over again. And how can we think about where we can actually accrue some kind of return so that what we're doing and giving can allow us to have breath and space and leave things around behind um, for others. So that was that was the thinking around thrivability. Well, I know uh, speaking for myself, I thank you uh, for the work that you have done, uh, especially around uh, that concept. But in general, you know, I, in your introduction, one word that I did not uh, put in there. Uh, that easily could have been inserted in the uh, bio is healer uh, because I do feel like your work allows uh, uh, at least opens a pathway for healing to be possible when we start to think about uh, this concept of uh, thrivability and this idea around it um, how do you see healing as that necessary pathway uh, along the road to uh, liberation. Yeah. I was having a conversation uh, with a soul sister of mine, Kendra Spirit, Kylie Arroyo, out in the West Coast. Uh, and Kylie and I were talking uh, and connecting nature and biodiversity to notions of thrivability and how you, where you get the most nutrients is at the soil. And we've been so far at the top, but we don't stay to the roots. And so um, one of the things that she, uh, we were talking about and, and actually we were talking about probability, and I said, you know, if I was to do this now, because this was almost, so January, it'll be three years since that report was produced, which means we're a little bit over three years since we were doing the conversations and work, not to add the fact that we entered a whole new portal season at the top of this new decade. So it's not the time has a different, has a different sphere. But one of the things that I would hold um, in my own evolution of learning is to even be more um, holistic and really hold in the thrivability around if we're not well as beings, if our beings aren't well, then we can't thrive. If our health isn't well, then we can't thrive. If our economics isn't well, we don't have the, the resources. If we, if we don't um, hold love, if we don't start introducing language of love into who and how we are, not as some esoteric thing, but as a fundamental element of what gives us both the drive, energy, and strategy to produce and stay committed and building the language and extracting ourselves from these corporate models of rigidity that were never designed for the masses to, to thrive. Um, I would look at being in health and wellness um, bring it into the conversation. I think we have to kind of like the social determinants. I think we have to operate and imagine much more holistically and see the wholeness of, of who we are, how we are, how are all of our identities, our abilities to hold our families, our abilities to be in relationship to our friends, our abilities to make time to read the, the voluminous stuff that we have to read, to have space to contemplate. All of that is a part of being able to thrive because for me, 
um, thriving is what are the conditions and the environment that allows me to become and be my best self. And one of the things that you just said, Darrell, and I've been giving some thought to, and I haven't fully landed one way or the other, but I'm holding it up and I'll, I'll share with you to ponder with me in spirit, is are we, are we trying to liberate or find freedom to or from? Like, is it, is, it, is it liberation from something or liberation to something? And is it a both and? And what is the power if we're not tethered to some from and being defined by some other from, but the two that allows the, the totality of who we are? What if we define and imagine that that holds the values um, that was much more pluralistic? How would we even approach the questions differently? That's something I would contemplate differently around thriving. Yes, yes, yes. Um, something that I, I, I said a little while ago, um, you know, this is, this is uh, probably the most unique opportunity we have to rebuild our realities not back into what they were, but into what they should have been. And if there is anyone out there doing the work to allow us to move in that direction, uh, it is definitely you. Um, and let's, let's kind of keep pushing along that, uh, that thought a little bit. Um, something a little bit more topical that has been happening um, in, the, in the industry, uh, we've been seeing you know, a lot of performative allyship or what uh, Dr. Terry Watson calls performative wokeness. Um, and as a counter narrative to that, one of the things that we've seen um, is a resurgence of, uh, you know, the, these sort of like counter notions, like for instance, we see you white American theater. Um, for those who may not be familiar uh, with this, you know, using an abolitionist framework, you try to move away from terminologies like calling out and you more so think about ways of calling in. Um, but it's, a, it's been a, a, a strategy to hold organizations accountable to uh, the missions um, that, they, uh, that they have uh, and also the narratives that they're putting out around their organization. I would love to get your take on uh, you know, not just We See You White American Theater, but, uh, you know, other campaigns as well that are, are really about uh, holding uh, organizations, particularly predominantly white institutions, accountable for the words that they are using, because words do have power. Yeah. Well, first of all, when it's, um, Toya said, um, bring up Lovecraft Country, who are you uninterrupted? Yes. Yes to that. That's the question folks could hold. If you were uninterrupted, what would you really do? Yes to that. I pulled out, uh, I, I live by, and this is actual real book, and I just gave one to one of my best friends, and I have, I, I live by it, and I highly recommend Nayira Wahi Salt. It is like delectable morsels of wisdom and chocolate, dark, rich, sea salt kind of chocolate, and you'll read something in it. And to this, we see you, and there are so many things that's revolutionary about the we see you, but yet still tethered to ongoing historical organizing. So I want to, I want to challenge the idea of the new, because these, we, we historically, the underground, the coming together, the communal, the organizing has been in existence. Um, and the, the thing that the many of the many things that I appreciate about we see you in other campaigns, um, one of the things is caught in, in this poem that I'll read quickly. It says, a lie is simply a lie. It draws its strength from belief. Stop believing in what hurts you. And that also connects to the, the both and, the liberate from and liberated to. And I agree with someone who is like, it's, it's a both and. But at some point, we have to decide where we're anchoring. And I think that um, the, the fact that this, we see you, the power in saying you are not invisible. You're, this isn't crafty. You're not stealth. This is out. I, we see you. And then a demand, not an ask, because the demand is rooted in an idea of a claim to a right. And the other elements of the demand of being connected to a claim to a right, it's not an inquiry. 
This is not a could you maybe. This is a demand to a claim of a right and listed in that in language that is not looking to be conformist to existing status quo, but capturing and redefining frames and language around that, the power of both language and saying, we see you, but we are one of we. And so there's no one leader in a Fannie Lou Hamer kind of way, right? There's this organized power. That's this collective power. That organizing, that framing that way, that getting very specific, that calling um, the demand. And I, I'm, of, I'm old school, I'm from the A. Sometimes you need to call out to call in. And I think that it depends on the, depends on the circumstance. And so you, case by case, as they would say in law school, case by case. Um, but I get the spirit of looking to build some solidarity. But I believe in building solidarity only with those who've earned your trust and who are demonstrating that they are committed to the same values as you. And so I think that the work that is happening um, on the ground and, the, and the, the other point that I want to bring up in this, that we're, there's so much power um, Alice Walker would be proud, you know, she's like the most common, <laughs> the most common way people give up their power is by thinking they don't have any. That's not the case. That is not the case right now. So it's not to say, I'm asking you to give me this. I'm saying we demand. And if you don't demand, there are consequences. And we are clear about that. And we're clear about it. And your this, I, I appreciate what Robin D'Angelo did with white fragility, but I will add we cannot keep leaning on the laurels of this idea of being fragile. Muscle up, do the work, make the change, and move forward because it's no longer a, a request. It is a demand because there are alternative universes that will be and have been built. And I think that's, that's, the, that's one of the major beauties and it connects to, so I wanna be really clear, this isn't just now. I can, my kitchen cabinet folks have been doing this. We have a way of seeing it differently in this moment where digital um, and connectivity is so fast. Technology has been able to give us the space and agency to have more real time um, and to leverage that energy and power. Not that the ideas and the organizing itself is new. These are built on within a te technological frame and where we have access in a different way. And I think it is imperative it is imperative for us to continue to step up and amplify the challenge, move beyond the rhetoric um, into the actions in uh, a very clear way where your dash will be defined by what you do. I, uh, I absolutely love that. I, I wanted to remind uh, some of the, the participants that uh, we are we're looking at the chat for questions that you may have or uh, comments that you're making. F feel free to drop some questions in there and we'll try to take a, take a few. Um, I, wanna, I wanna talk a little bit more about language. I don't wanna move off of language just yet, uh, especially because what we're seeing, in, you know, and again, this, this ain't new, you know, what we're seeing is a lot of coded language or deficit-based language. Um, some of my uh, some of my students from uh, City College are are here in the virtual space tonight. Mm -hmm. And one of the things you know, I spend a very decent amount of class time talking about asset-based or strength-based language because words really are uh, important. And I'm curious, uh, what advice uh, might you have for arts administrators? Um, or, or artists or grant writers who are looking or trying to find ways to, to articulate the value proposition of their organization uh, and their work uh, in neighborhoods that may be experiencing long-term systemic inequities while sim simultaneously still valuing the lived experiences uh, and ancestral knowledge that already exists within those communities as well. I think you just said it, Darrell, <laughs> uh, what, what he said. Um, <laughs> what I'll, what I'll, how we are connected, I, I absolutely believe language is super important. It was one of our first technologies. Right? So if you think about technology, it's a methodology that allows us to be and, and, and connect 
in better ways efficiently. Language is a technology. It's one of the ancestral technologies, even if when it was, uh, whether it's in iconography, um, iconography uh, in various ways in which we communicate. And quite frankly, theater was a language. Um, one, many people who couldn't read, um, illiteracy was a, was a big reality. And so the way people understood others and themselves was defined by how that was portrayed on stage. And they took that back uh, as true. And one of the things that uh, we talked about in, um, in doing the Thrivability Report and Carrie McCarthy and Maureen Knighton uh, were, were both very um, clear uh, and intentional about this and which aligned with our values is that we did not want to do another report that had um, a deficit-based frame that led with, oh, whoa, we have no money, there's no endowment, there's no, there's no, 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 whoa, whoa, whoa. All still, all real in some way, but as if that was the totality of the story, right? That if the story itself was solely framed by this economic structure and that be defined the who. And, and I would say to artists and others, first always is, Tell your own story, like find, name your joy. Name the joy. I didn't know we were poor until I learned from other people later. When I grew up, I didn't know. Like I didn't grow up with that frame that we were poor until I read somewhere that, oh, we, must, <laughs> we were poor. Okay. <laughs> so That's what this is. That's what we've been living. <laughs> like all of that joy, all of that dancing in the living room, all that learning dance from Paul Abdul and, and Janet Jackson on the TV. I didn't know it was because I was missing out on being in some studio. No, my studio was my living room. Like it was, if we start naming that where, where we learn how to draw um, in, in these enclaves that was in the, around on the corner in this kind of way, others give us this frame and socialization that that is bad. Own your truth. Name your cultural spaces. Many cultural spaces have been in churches and in basements, in backyards. Like these are havens where ideation happens, where creativity happens. Where do you find your levels of inspiration? In music, tons of music. Sometimes I can't work without hearing certain songs in movies, in media. Name your cultural spaces. Do not let others define who you are, where you then have to be reactive to and respond to and then say and defend, like, you don't have to defend someone else's construct. If you choose to, choose it on your terms, but you don't have to defend someone else's constructs. Lead with who and where you are and teach, because there's a lot of unlearning that needs to happen and a lot of teaching that needs to happen. And I think, where, I think quite frankly, um, white America has so much to learn and gain from the decentering of the white American frame, particularly heteronormative white male frame and anything religious frame and anything that deviates from that, there's so much you're missing. James Baldwin talked about it all the time, there's so much you're missing out on. So I would say lead with where your roots are, your joy has been, your learning has been, lead with it unapologetically. Teach, know that you have something to teach others. And when they resist, because they will, because they have not yet had to learn and translate the multiple languages of culture. They've centered, it's been a single monolithic kind of culture. But if you want to teach greater translations and languages of culture, which is what we are, it's an invitation. But don't let it define you and don't let, it, you, don't, don't let you have to feel like you have to depart from their frame. Hold your frame and demand and know that where there are um, underinvestments or, or, or disinvestments, know that that was intentional and it's not your fault. Your community did nothing different. Your family did nothing different. Your friends did nothing different. The garbage that, is, that would have been uh, all over, littered around, would have been in any other neighborhood that didn't have garbage um, investments and them coming to clean it up. It's nothing different. But there's a, there's, there's a consistent socialized belief that we are the, the um, sources of our perceived deficits and that our assets are invalid. And I'm like, bring them to the light, hold them unapologetically and tell them that they have something to learn. That's, that's what I say. Mm. 
You know, uh, one of my favorite quotes that this is reminding me of uh, is from the late uh, Black female Congresswoman, um, Barbara Jordan, who said, uh, what the people want is simple. They want an America as good as its promise. Yes. As good as its promise. Yes. That's, it's that simple. Yes. Be who you said you were on paper. To quote Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Be who you said you were on paper. Because, you know, especially, you know, we're in the room with a lot of arts administrators, uh, a lot of teaching artists. Um, uh, you know, if, if we put something down in a strategic plan or a lesson plan or whatever it is, whoever's critiquing our work, especially as, you know, someone from uh, one of the many BIPOC communities working in those spaces, oh, we are going to be held accountable to what we put in that lesson plan or what we put down on in that strategic plan. Uh, or that program design, they're going to come in at it and look at it and use it as justification as why you didn't get that promotion or why you didn't get that raise or why you didn't get that job. So be true to who you said you were on paper. We're not asking for a lot. Yes. Well, I mean, if I can connect what you just said brilliantly, Darrell, uh, to these statements, <laughs> these statements of solidarity. Yes. Uh, populating all over the place, there are a couple of things that I'd like to say to that. Right? So this idea of being true to um, what you're saying on paper or on digital or on any other place where folks can actually read and take in your idea that you're saying is true. I think that if there isn't a direct, not I'm going to commit and here's our actions, within a very specific timeline, because see, I think that there's a, there's a disconnect to and I have some thoughts about the on paper because, you know, the, I had such issues with the Constitution going through law school because there was on paper. They were true to themselves on paper. We were not part of that on paper. Indigenous people were not a part of that on paper. Women, okay. right? Like, they were. <laughs> and we keep trying to, like, amend, amend, amend. And I'm like, I don't know if you can amend poisonous fruit so much. You can't make a good apple pie with soiled apples. I'm from the South, so I don't know about that. That said, if we want to start from right now, <laughs> Ooh, let's get into it. We want to start from right now and say, be who you are, as you say on paper, then there should be a very clear mapping of where you're going to disrupt some existing things. And the, the accountability needs to start from the board. And I mean, if you are not a board that are, that's in trust, you're a trustee. If you're not stewarding that language, then maybe you should shift to another board that don't hold those values, right? Like if these are the values that you are outwardly expressing and you're looking to see where there's change that's going to happen, then put a timeline in place when it's gonna happen. In addition to your words, we're gonna do this, I'm gonna do some training and we're gonna do this. And then, you know, I think there should be an audit of the actual people who live in these institutions, who's working in these institutions to be able to actually say, is this true? in a glass door kind of way, anonymously. We're like, here's our statement. We ask the people who actually work there, is this true? What would that yield if we start getting the, a more collect a collective um, with, the, with the space to create safety for those most vulnerable, right? We don't want people losing their jobs because we know that's real, but also to begin to push, continue to push for the actions that's necessary uh, for the change. So I'm like, be who you're on paper today, because when you are, there's been plenty of paper where I was not, <laughs> you were who you, <laughs> you were doing exactly what you said you was going to do on paper. Um, yeah, so. Yes, and it, there's a question if you want. Um. Yes, from Carolyn. Uh, so C Carolyn asks, uh, can you address all the recent discussions about inclusion and diversity and the appointment of diversity officers. Does it mute or divert the discussion? Uh, Carolyn, so my, my thoughts about inclusion, I'll start with inclusion. I think, when, when I think about the word inclusion, I'm like included into what? Because usually when you start talking about inclusion, there's some, uh, somebody's already at the center that there's, there's a perimeter in which you're saying, come on in, which means that who's ever at the center has already defined the space. And I would, I would ask us to just interrogate 
what that means. I understand the spirit of, of inviting in, but if the culture doesn't change, if you're saying invite into my culture and welcome and enjoy my culture home, but nothing else changes in it, then we're not addressing the problem. Diversity, um, I think that the, the, if we're thinking solely from the space that an individual or two within an institution is going to be the solution for a systemic structural cultural problem, we are, we've already lost. So this, this idea of the appointment of diversity officers, if there isn't a permeation of true culture shift in every facet, where there is, in the same way, model after the we see you, you don't see one person becoming the spokesperson. It becomes the responsibility of the entire entity. And what's the work where you hold the entire the entity as diversity, well, I wouldn't say diversity office. <laughs> that wouldn't be my language. I think it should be more than that. I think that, that we're talking about, for me, is anti-racism, anti-oppression. Do the work that's going to um, not propagate policies and practices that oppress anyone. Um, so if you're going to build a culture around that and not hinge it on a single, a single person, in these ideas of come being included in my existing culture that's been part of the status quo, it's going to be, you've, you've set that individual up to fail and it becomes performative. And I think Darrell mentioned that earlier, it becomes a performative act. And then we're going to lose time and time is going to go by because you got to evaluate it. And so we got five more years later and we're losing out on the moment. And so I think that um, the, to the question of does it mute or divert the discussion, um, it may, it may not mute the discussion, but it doesn't affect change. People may keep talking about it, but we're not going to see the transformation because we're not centering it in the culture shifts that's going to be necessary. And we're hinging it on too few interventions that will never be able to undo the layers of interlocking that's holding that culture together. Yes, yes, yes. And, you know, I, I think about this often, and I, I probably, I've said this a few times before, but, you know, it's just worthy of discussion because, you know, oftentimes if you do see uh, someone from uh, one of the multitude of BIPOC communities working in uh, predominantly white institutions, whether they be nonprofit, uh, corporations, government, they're often, they often are there in the role of director of community engagement or vice president of social impact or, you know, so on and so on and so on. First of all, uh, our only, uh, you know, that's not our only area of expertise, first of all, you know, uh, you know especially living uh, on it like a both and sort of like framework is like, yes, well, you know, and thinking, you know, about Kimberly Crenshaw and these ideas of uh, intersectionality is like, yes, I am black, but I am also great at math. I'm not, but there's someone out there who is, who could be running, you know, a tech company, you know, as a, a chief financial officer, you know, or some other C-suite exec. So, you know, it's, it, sometimes this also starts to play into that same sort of trope, you know, you, 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 you know, you so brilliantly articulated how, you know, we were left out of a lot of those uh, documents intentionally, but also there's this sort of unwritten code when you start looking at organizations and seeing where, you know, they're, they are placing us. They are very intentionally writing us out of so many of these different areas. Um, and oftentimes why they do have us in like uh, community engagement, uh, social impact, they want us to sit in the corner, you know, and, and play the nanny to their to their 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 well-being programs, their well-meaning programs. So they have the opportunity to take, you know, people around and go, look how hard they're working to maintain our house. Right. So like yeah. that, that's that that same sort of, you know, idea of, of plantation has really just morphed. Like you said, like all these things, they're not new. It's yeah. just they're putting them in ways where it's harder to see if you're not looking out for it. Yeah. Um, 
Well, and what we're doing differently is that we're not buying into respectability politics in the way that we were before. We're not asking, we're demanding um, to uh, a really good friend of mine, Sandra Jackson Dumont would say in a heartbeat, yes. diversity officer is the, the CEO. Like if the CEO and the head board chair are not the head of, of inclusion, equity, whichever, which, and I, I believe in equity, but you have to understand to even get to the equity, to know where the gaps are, you need to be rooted in understanding in the analysis of where the gaps are and be ready and intentional to commit to what's gonna be investments that's gonna be necessary to, to fill those gaps. But that, should, that starts, that's not at a, any level, if, if, if you believe in and work in the hierarchical frame, it's not at any level other than those who have the greatest power to effect change. To Kevin's question, do I think that benchmarks for equity in traditionally white organizations being supported by large funders will result in the continued dilution of support for the organizations that were engaged in your study? Yes. I, I think there's been enough, there, there has been enough investment um, in, in primarily white institutions writ large. That doesn't mean all. I am not saying that primarily white institutions do not need funding. I'm not even saying that all of them are not doing good work. So let me be very clear on this recording. That is not what I am saying. I am saying that there has been such a disinvestment and, and such a disinvestment that has compounded over the years where the, from an equity perspective, there needs to be some deep investments in the communities that have been where $25,000 has been the average amount of investment for a period of time. So it's a distinction of saying that there is no need, it has nothing to do with need, it's saying if we are looking to shift and right side and see where we can support and build um, the infrastructure, the capacity, invest in the neighborhoods, then you're gonna, you can't just do it uh, with what's left over after you, what you've given to the larger institutions. And you can't just give it to the larger institution and say hire uh, the, the engage and partner with the smaller institutions because your budget is big. Change that calculus. All of those calculuses are constructed. Change it. Don't let that be the practice. Change that policy. There was another question that the that came up that was, I saw. I wanted to. I'm, uh, amen, Toya. Yeah, I grew up poor. I, and I wouldn't even say I grew up poor. I, again, I didn't know we were poor until I learned we were poor. But nothing about that felt poor. Um, being the eldest of seven in a family where my mom came from a family of 12. So we're probably one of the most resourceful people, um, you know, because you learn how to build in, a, in an amazing way. But yes, and still go to elite schools and still can do more than, more than speak to the um, condition of the layered identities that I hold. And I want to also be clear um, that the layered identities that I may hold doesn't automatically translate to other black women from the South, former dancers. It's, we, we are not a monolithic mm. story where one person can be the spokesperson, which means that mm. as a collective, we, we need to build more um, relationships to even get to understanding the differences and nuances um, of how varied and how rich we really are. Mm. I'm, you know, I'm curious. I love this stuff, y'all. I'm like, come on, are we ready? I mean, this is a whole, like, we, the, the arts and culture creative community, we are the ones. Like, there is no one. There's no one who's waiting for it. And I, and I also believe in making sure that we're fully resourced to do our work and that the, the creative um, capital, the creative equity that comes from the work should come back to all of us and all of you who do this work. I absolutely believe that, which means we need new structures and models and not being forced to have to sell everything off. Um, because of the consistent disinvestment. But we're the ones where, in an Octavia Butler kind of way, we can completely reimagine this. Completely. Okay. You know, something that I, I reflect on, you know, I won't say all the time, but I will say often, you know, I think as, you know, as artists, speaking for my artist self, you know, we tend to forget that when the Titanic was going down, the band played on. You have a yeah. responsibility to lean into your creativity and your, your, uh, your liberation base. When the pressure gets highest, it is not yeah. time to go back and not, no, that is when the world or the people actually need you most. So if there's political unrest, where you at, right? 
if people are sick and dying in the streets, where you at? That needs to be a whole other sort of like campaign, like with Boost Mogul, Mobile, you know, back in the day, where you at? Where y'all at? Yes. If you only coming around when, you know, things are like rosy or, you know, maybe you just don't happen to like the person that's in office, that's not enough. Yeah. We have people dying in the streets. Where are you? Yes. Right? Yes. And if what you're saying is you're an artist, your responsibility, part of it as an artist, is to move us forward in a way that's having us think more critically about the world around us. Where are you? And I'm not saying they're not out there. They're, they definitely are. I really love the um, Afro-futurist and Afro-surrealist movement uh, that is happening right now. Um, shout out to uh, Woke uh, right now on Hulu. You know, that, that's a really good one. And also uh, Toya uh, mentioned earlier, Lovecraft Country. Yes. Because yes, all of that. Yes. It's going to take all of that. Yes. Um, so I'm, li I'm looking at the time. Sorry. All of that, and, and the only thing I would add to to that is if you haven't been the ones who's showing up, you need to be the one on the front line. Like, oh, okay. I, I just want to be really clear. Okay. So very often, there is a tendency to continue to lean into the black and brown bodies that are on the front line doing the work because an expectation is that you've been doing it historically, you know more, you can do it, you can, yes, we're gonna actually stand with the science a little bit further back. Um, mm. And I think I want us to hold too, if, if we're li literally centering in equity, it's not just those who have generationally been doing it. If you have not been generationally doing that work, where are you at? That's where are you? I don't have to ask the ones who've been doing it, who has, who can speak to their their aunts and their uncles and their grandparents and all who've been doing it. Go back, generations been doing it. I want to talk to the ones who can't claim, who doesn't hold that story, who doesn't hold that experience. It's your turn. Let's pass the baton and figure out some different, some different lanes, not just the ones who have always been the ones who are doing it and whose bodies are bearing the brunt, whose wealth mm. is bearing the brunt and the trauma and the, 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 the blood trauma because of constantly having to be the ones on the front line. And, you know, just in case someone may be watching and, and may be a little confused on uh, where this wisdom or knowledge is coming from, uh, from Lisa, well, we have over 400 years worth of receipts that, uh, you know, will, <laughs> will validate every word, every pearl that just came out of her. Not to say that, and I, this is another trope, and, uh, you know, I'm so glad, like, Toya is on the call today. There's another uh, trope uh, that I got from her. Um, it's, you know, as it, 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 she got from, uh, from someone else, too, but, like, have you ever noticed that when... Uh, a uh, black woman says something, there's always a rebuttal, right? <laughs> Everyone's always trying to find and pick like, what? not that you need 400 years of receipts, but just in case, right? All right. Um, Ralph, like we have, we have uh, two questions that I think we missed. I just wanted, we okay. have a couple of minutes. So one, the, one of them was, how do you help others find their joy when all they've heard their entire life is deficit-based language? Um, and another one is uh, from Carolyn, often grantors require a corporate approach to how can a small BIPOC thrive and grow? What are the pillars needed? Some suffer from founder syndrome. Mm. Um, so the joy, what that's making me think, I'm, I'm, I'm conjuring my cousin right now. And um, one of my cousins, um, he, he, he would tell, he recently said, he's like, you know, I used to, one of my friends used to say to me, you know, you're on the spectrum. And he was like, I know I'm not, no, I'm not, of course I'm not. And then he actually took a test and he's like, you know what, cuz I am on the spectrum. I was like, don't worry, I'm on the spectrum too. And he, we talk about this idea of joy because I, I, I talked earlier about finding, I believe we need to root in our love and our passion. I think that it is, it needs to be a part of our language and it needs to be a part of our, certainly our inspiration and our strategy. And so that question um, around how do we find our joy, um, I know it's deeply personal. So I wanna say that, that it's not universal. 
that one thing is not necessarily translatable to another. And I want to respect that and honor that. And if you're struggling with finding your joy, um, there isn't a one size fit all. Uh, what I'd like to offer for anyone who's struggling with finding their joy um, is leaning into and creating space and remembering whenever it may have happened, even in the slightest thing. I find joy sometimes when I look out of my window. There's, I live in, um, in Mount Vernon, New York, on the Moosey Lenape lands. But in Mount Vernon, every now and then, I get to see an eagle flying. It's just around this season. It just starts showing up. And that eagle, when I'm sitting here zooming into eternity, that eagle gives me joy. So something as small which is big because there is no small joy. So let me, let me adapt myself. There's no small joy. Wherever the thing that could inspire, that inspires you and hold, journal it and do a recall. Write it and do a recall and see if you can build um, and accumulate some identities around that joy space. And then the, the other one was about grantors and corporations. What was, what was that? Yeah, let me, let me look back. Uh, okay. Here it is. Often grantors require a corporate approach to how can a small BIPOC thrive and grow? What are the pillars needed? Some suffer from founder syndrome. Carolyn, I mean, that's, Carolyn, that is so layered because our whole, um, the sector is root, is even named not for profit. Like its whole identity is an extension from the profit model. We haven't, we, we, we haven't built um, language, vocabulary, and understanding to center the mission and the impact. Because if we did, we would flip and know that revenue is in service of investments, not expenses, investments, because the investments is what allows for our mission. And so we need to completely reimagine and, and decolonize and decapitalize our understanding of our receipts. And, and looking to build our financials that um, speaks to both the, that speaks primarily to the impact you're seeking. That said, uh, often grantors require a corporate approach. I will, I'm, lear I'm in, I, I talk to a number of them and I know that that sounds, I mean, I edit myself all the time. I'd be like, yeah, but I don't mean everybody. So let's be clear. But in the few, I know that there are some who are struggling to reimagine what, it, what philanthropy looks like um, because there's been a lot more um, calling out to call in in every sector, including philanthropy, to decolonize it, to decapitalize it, to reimagine even what, the, what kinds of structures you support, what are the conditions of that kind of support. And I think that a small BIPOC, um, we're thriving and growing, I believe that the clearer you are about who you're intending uh, to impact and transform and, and enliven and inspire, no, I didn't say serve, but who you really are try, working to activate vision and, and, and build in a way, being in conversation with them about that value proposition will then in turn have them invest in you differently. I think we bought into, I love this thing, it's a good thing so much, but not holding true um, relationship and thus accountability to ensure that the things that you're doing um, is having the intended impact that the, actually the ones with whom you are seeking to uh, fortify, seeking to um, inspire want. So I think it's a layered, it's a layered question around how to thrive and grow. And I, I believe we, we need to do some more reimagining um, outside if we like straight blackboarded. If this didn't exist, how would I design this today? Thank you so much for that. Um, I just want to give a quick uh, shout out to uh, Toya Lillard who dropped the actual quote in the chat. Uh, anybody ever notice any time a black woman says anything, there's a rebuttal and never reflection. I show you. Okay. I would add to that. Uh, read um, Bell Hooks, Ain't I a Woman? Highly recommend. And then follow it up with John Morgan's When Chicken Heads Come Home to Roost. Whoop. Okay. Oh, yeah. Um. 
y'all resource list is going to be popping after this is done. Um, sadly, very sadly for me, I don't know how anyone else feels. So I'll speak from, uh, you know, personal. Um, we have come to the final question of the evening with Lisa. Uh, and I want to, I want to talk about uh, this, this idea of uh, allyship, um, this idea of accomplice, and this idea of a co-conspirator. Um, first, I want to be very clear that uh, your allyship, especially performative allyship, is is never enough. Um, and as a as a co-conspirator, right in the process. If, if you're if you're able to get to that point the idea there is that you are culpable in whatever means there is to my liberation and the liberation of my people the question uh, on an individual level what could a white accomplice or co-conspirator watching this take back to their organization and immediately implement to advance the cause of equity and justice in their organization and or classroom, workspace, et cetera. Institution of higher learning. <laughs> um, I would say go to Lilla Watson, start there. If you've come here to help me, then you're wasting your time. But if you've come here because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. You need to, Peggy McIntosh, your, where you're bound. I think about this idea of accomplice and co-conspirator. If you don't, if you don't have anything to lose, the degree to which you can lose by being present will determine the degree of your solidarity. If, if you're only losing some comfort, so that idea is another thing like to lean into discomfort, I'm like, I'm over, I'm over all that, I'm over the fragile, I'm over the leaning, and I'm over the discomfort because people are dying and have been consistently dying, not being uncomfortable. Um, if, it's, if it's marginal discomfort, that's the, that's the degree of your solidarity. If you are, are finding that your, your, your home is being disrupted, people are questioning you, that's the degree of your solidarity. If, you're, if you may lose your job and economics can be disrupted, that's the degree of your solidarity, right? Like you can actually measure the degree of your solidarity to where your vested repercussions are to the change that you're seeking. And I think that if you're bound to and or from liberation or both, then measure the degree of where you are committing for the change. And I change, you know, I, 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 I say this, I'm like, when people say, well, how long or to what, how, how, to what extent? The answer for me is until it's done. So be in it until it's done. And, and so that means that you'd have to be clear on what that it is for you and what done looks like and where you're ready and be in conversation with your family and be in conversation with your loved ones about the repercussions of holding this value because you can't blow something up without getting a whole bunch of dirt and debris. You can't, you can't be, have a breakthrough without breaking something. So be ready for that. Stop looking for change and maintaining status quo. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I don't want this to end. Uh, but that is not all up to me, unfortunately. You are a goddess. I just wanted to, do you have any, any final words that you would like to, to say to, to everyone? Say thank y'all in my Atlanta, Georgia kind of way. Thank y'all for saying, <laughs> <laughs> like saying at the end of the day and, you know, thank you for reading Thrivability and keep pushing it. It's iterative, like keep growing from, evolving from. Thank you, thank you for spending this time with me. I, I'm so grateful, I'm so grateful. Um, how, can, uh, how, can, how can everyone keep up with you? 
Um, sure, I, you can reach out to Lisa, um, Lisa at YanceyConsulting.com. Um, I know my colleagues are here, so Yolitha can put it there. Uh, we, yeah, Lisa Yancey, is, I'm pretty transparent. I live transparently. <laughs> so you can look up Lisa Yancey with an E, Y-A-N-C-E-Y, not C-Y, um, pretty accessible. But I'm just, I'm deeply grateful for you staying and coming and, and um, I know some of you, it was um, part of your course. You had to be here. And uh, for those of you who had to be here, I, I see you. And I, 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 um, I hope that there's something that, that imprints you about today's conversation. Well, thank you, everyone. If you could give some like spirit fingers to Lisa, send her that energy, Ashe. Thank you for everything. Um, our lives will forever be enriched by uh, this conversation. Um, and so again, I could not thank you enough. So thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, so now uh, I know we are going to do a quick transition into uh, breakout groups. Um, I just wanted to, to give a quick plug uh, for my web series flow. Uh, there's an episode that literally is about the premiere uh, in like five minutes. Um, We'll probably drop that in the chat. I'm talking to Dr. Yolanda Sealy Ruiz, who's a associate professor at Teachers College. We talk all things love and forgiveness of oneself. Uh, I would go check that out, especially if you're not hanging around to the uh, the breakout groups portion. Um, for those who are stake sticking around, we have a treat for you. Um, Shoba, do we want to give directions first, or do I want to talk content? Yeah. Um, well, I'll give directions and then you can talk content. How's that? Um, okay. okay. So Darrell is going to kind of give you the guiding questions to think about. And we're going to ask that when you get into your breakout groups, you just kind of take a breath because Lisa gave us so much, um, to, to just sit on and, um, so do that. And then, um, what we have, we're going to post, um, in the chat box, a Google doc where each group can take notes so that we all have that as a resource to go back to. Um, and if each group could just assign a scribe to kind of take notes, um, we want to give you enough time to kind of, you know, process and discuss. Um, so we're not going to bring you back too soon and we're not going to have time to share out, but we do want you to walk away with those notes. Darrell? Thank you so much for that, Shoba. Mm -hmm. um, so when you uh, log in at the top of this, there was a, a question that was uh, uh, projected. It asked, what was one hope uh, you had today for a more equitable tomorrow? Um, and I wanna try to bring that back here. So it's like a callback to that. Um, so when we go into these breakout rooms, I want you to think about um, what you can do immediately on an individual level to bring that hope into a reality. And then I want you to think about what can you do collectively to bring that hope into a reality. Um, I think we have, uh, Shoba, how much time do we have for this? Um, we're going to give them till about 6.20. So about 20, 25, 22 minutes, somewhere in there. About 20 minutes. Um, and we, we will also post those questions. Um, and so you'll see that being broadcast out to the different groups as well. But again, so it's thinking about this idea of what it is your hope today is for a more equitable tomorrow. And then what can you do to make that a reality? All right. 